Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to our session of um, on poster podium presentation in ocular oncology and tumors. Our first uh, speaker will be Dr. Dipankur Das. Dr. Dipankur, please come on to the podium. He will be presenting on study of FSM and Raman spectroscopy in ophthalmic pathology specimens. To ask uh, for how many month, how many months of five fluorouracil you considered before stamping as uh, non-resolving? We gave four cycles of five fluorouracil and uh, lubricants also were given. Ah, lubricants and steroids were also given along with it, but uh, the patient developed surface toxicity co uh, co after the fourth cycle. It was increased and the visual acuity also reduced. Okay, then you considered uh, ah, then. Uh, and the lesion was also progressing. The superior lesion was progressing. So, uh, in the histopathology report, what did it come up as? Like? It came as a uh, squamous uh, grade, grade 3 uh, neoplasia. But it was intraepithelial, right? No invasion was seen. No invasion. No invasion was yeah, seen. It was written severe dysplasia there. Yeah. No. This one, uh, I mean, this is a subset of uh, patients where none of the topical medications or in per perilegional uh, injections work uh, hmm. among all them. Hmm. So uh, what is your regular protocol? How you go through the this thing? Do you uh, start with one drug first and then go uh, this thing? Or is there an order that you go through? Ah, yes, sir. We uh, first start with interferon, uh, inter uh, perilegional interferon with uh, interferon drops. So we tried that. Uh, so it how was. Many I mean, do you do that with every patient that's uh, presenting like this? Yeah, we give interferon inter first, okay. uh, and usually if it is not responding, we'll uh, take like five. How many, how many cycles of? Uh, we, in this case, we gave two, two, uh, one month apart, two in, in doses of interrelational st uh, steroid. Which yeah, and uh, then after that, uh, do you do topical as well uh, to supplement it with? Topical? Yeah, yeah, we have uh, giving topical interferon along with it. Okay. After two months. Uh, after two months, the second uh, after the second dose, still the uh, lesion was uh, progressing. So we uh, converted into five five fluorouracil. One person drops. So you you do uh, mitomycin C last. Ah. Uh. Uh, next, we will call uh, Dr. Komal Bakal for presenting on correlation of secondary glaucoma and high risk uh, histopathology features in retinoblastoma. Over to you, Komal. Yes. Good morning, everyone. I will be presenting on correlation of secondary glaucoma and high risk histopathology features in retinoblastoma. So as we all know, the histo uh, high risk histopathological features are uh, invasion of the anterior chamber, invasion of the choroid more than 3 millimeters, invasion of post laminar uh, re region, of, uh, region of optic nerve or cut end of the optic nerve. There are also certain clinical features which can predict whether a particular eye will have a high risk feature on histopathology or not. These include symptoms more than 6 months, poor visual acuity at presentation, bufthalmos, ectropia on UV, orbital cellulitis, glaucoma and neovascularization of iris. So we already know that glaucoma is a clinical high risk feature. So why are we doing this study? So here we are trying to stratify the numerical value of raised IOP and its correlation with high risk histopathological features. And we are trying to understand whether NVI further adds to this risk or not. So we uh, retrospectively analyzed the medical records of 460 retinoblastoma patients who underwent primary enucleation from January 2011 to December 2020. Factors noted were demographic details, presence or absence of secondary glaucoma, stratification of these patients were done uh, based on the IOP range, and correlation of prevalence of high-risk features on histopathology with the IOP groups was uh, noted, and correlation of presence of NVI with the high-risk features was noted. So out of the 460 eyes, 169 patients had secondary glaucoma with a mean IOP of 32 millimeter of mercury. So when we uh, analyzed the data, we found that uh, 
uh, th only 37% of patients without glaucoma showed high risk histopathology features, whereas 66% of patients uh, had high risk features on histopathology who had glaucoma. Coming to the IOP range, in the range between 22 to 30, 55% patients had high risk features. Range between 31 to 40, 79% and more than 40, 75% had high risk features. This shows us that the risk keeps on increasing as the uh, IOP range increases. Also with the NVI, patients with NVI, 69% uh, of them had high risk features on histopathology. This tells us that NVI doesn't really add to the uh, risk factor here. So a similar study done by Kim et al. in Caucasian po population also showed uh, similar results. When we compared the two studies, we noted that the mean IOP in high risk features positive as well as negative patients in our study was lower. That is that uh, we can say that uh, in Asian Indians, the, um, the, the eyes are more prone to high risk features even at a lower IOP as compared to the Caucasian population. This aligns with our previous study where we had compared the overall uh, prevalence of high risk features. Uh, the, uh, the risk was more in Asian Indian eyes as compared to the Caucasians. So secondary glaucoma is an important independent clinical predictor factor for high risk histopathology regardless of NVI. Increase in the range of IOP is associated with greater risk, although the risk seems to remain fairly constant as the IOP rises above 40 millimeter of mercury. And high risk features are noted in Asian Indian eyes at a lower IOP as compared with the Caucasian eyes. Thank you. Well, it's a nice presentation and it's very impressive to see that you do such histopathology in all the patients to study mm -hmm. the glaucoma. Uh, did it have any significance in the treatment part? Uh, so these were already in, uh, primarily treated, enucleated yeah. eyes, but uh, whenever we go forward, so we are uh, go going towards the trend of globe salvage. So it will be important to know when whenever a patient has secondary glaucoma, we should be more careful in regards of globe salvage. So we can that can be helpful. Uh, very nice study. <coughs> One question: Why do you feel glaucoma is a high risk factor uh, or one of the risk factor for a tumor to have a HRF? So there are multiple things. There are, there are various mechanisms of this glaucoma. One is direct tumor seeding of the angle, which is of course a high risk feature in itself. Second is neovascular, first is actually neovascular region, then tumor seeding. Uh, and third is pupillary block, which means the tumor is already pushing the lens forward and there is pupillary block. Uh, so all these things uh, are the reasons I feel why the high risk features are more significant. Okay, thank you. Komal, any possible explanation of why in your group more than 40 millimeter mercury pressure, the risk came down compared yes. to the 30 to 40 group? So, any yes. possible explanation you um, thought through? We don't really have an explanation for that right now. And that 40 is right now arbitrary. We'll have to have a ROC curve analysis and then get a, a definitive value above which we can say that above this, the risk is higher. Yeah, true. Okay, thanks Koma. Thank you. So next I will call up uh, Dr. Mrithika Sen to present on impact of COVID-19 on features and management of uh, 830 consecutive patients with uveal melanoma. Good morning everyone. Um, so as we know, COVID-19 affected all branches of medicine, including ophthalmology, and we have a number of uh, publications on this. But when, when we do a literature search on reports on the impact of COVID-19 on ocular oncology, there is a dearth of reports with uh, the first one coming in from India on retinoblastoma, <clears throat> followed by a one, one from United Kingdom on uh, the impact of COVID-19 on uveal melanoma. Both these studies showed that patients who were presenting during COVID-19 had more advanced disease and many of them required enucleation as compared to the pre-COVID era. So the purpose of this study was to uh, evaluate the management and outcome of patients with uveal melanoma before and during the COVID-19 pandemic and the related restrictions. So this was a retrospective study um, which was done on patients who were treated between January 2018 to October 2021. And we classified the period as 
pre covid 19 uh, included the years 2018 and 19 and um, the period after covid 19 was 2020 and 2021 uh patients were treated with either uh, iodine 125 plaque radiotherapy or enucleation so looking at the overall numbers in each of the year there was no uh, statistically significant difference in terms of the total number of patients presenting in 2020 or 2021 but when we look at the monthly distribution of the patients uh there was a significant drop between april to june 2020 that corresponds to the fewer number of patients who were being referred to as well as presenting with symptoms to the clinic uh when we look at the tumor thickness again um uh, per month there was a rise in the tumor thick in in the thicker uh, tumors presenting during covid from june 2020 onwards in terms of the treatment there was an increase in the enucleation rate which was observed in 2021 as compared to the other years but this was not statistically significant when we look at the monthly distribution of the patients again in the june of 2020 corresponding to the fewer number of patients presenting there was a drop in the number of patients who were being treated with plaque radiotherapy however this returned to a um, an overall consistent value uh, in the following year in 2021 in terms of the number of patients who were undergoing enucleation in january of 2021 there was a dramatic increase in the number of patients who required enucleation so um we compared the corresponding periods 9 months between january to september in 2019 versus 2021 and we found that there was a significant in- increase in the tumor thickness as well as the number of patients who required enucleation uh, indicating that patients were presenting with neglected large and extensive tumors to conclude covid-19 pandemic did result in delayed presentation of these patients and who came with more advanced disease this has uh, doc- there has been a documented increase in the number of patients requiring enucleation and this is something that we uh, probably need to follow up in future also in terms of the patients who are presenting with the type of uh, genetic mutations uh, thank you very good study dr mrithika i'd like to ask those cases which you enucleated between january to september 9 months all those 19 were new cases or they were follow up for the long term and uh, uh, post uh, treatment or what what they were so these were all treatment naive <clears throat> patients these were the patients who underwent primary enucleation okay so uh, uh, did you analyze or sub analyze in your study that uh, uh, and they could have come earlier or uh, uh, was there any question here asked to them when so, they noticed yeah. the symptoms and when did right. they come so we did look at whether the patients were pre- you know when the symptoms started and the duration uh, the gap between the beginning of the symptoms and their presentation to us there was no significant difference in like they, there was no delayed presentation as such from the time of onset of symptoms as compared to the previous years and there was no delay in the treatment as such because ocular oncology was being treated as an on an emergent basis so as soon as they presented they were being treated okay great presentation mithika so i was just curious to understand like you said that um, during the covid pandemic they presented uh, in advance with an advanced disease so what did you look into what were the reasons behind this delayed presentation was it socio economic was it transport or yeah there were multiple factors involved um majority of the times especially with uveal melanoma uh one thing that we found significant when patients were presenting during covid pandemic was that those patients th- there were more number of patients presenting with pain now pain is not a very common symptom in uveal melanoma most of the time they are asymptomatic so when patients are asymptomatic they were really not going to the uh, either the primary centers or to the tertiary levels for any eye condition unless it was an emergency with red eye or with pain which is not seen
seen with uveal melanoma other than that every other factors which have been found um, important were there was problem with transportation there were a lot of restrictions in terms of patients who were coming from uh, beyond a certain distance but other than that in terms of the treatment being provided there was no delay so these were in just the uh, restrictions imposed for the lockdown which was causing a delay okay thanks yeah, but then you just noticed that there was no delay in presentation from patients then what exactly do you feel was like different during covid like why did the tumor thickness right. and enucleation this thing increased right. the rate increased so i don't uh, so one of the things was that again patients are asymptomatic till they notice visual acuity decreasing which does not happen unless there is srf in the macular area or the tumor is involving the posterior pole so they're not going for the routine checkup even patients who probably had nevi earlier were not really following up it was only when they started having the symptoms that they were going to the uh, ophthalmologist so one just quick question so what do you feel is the like what is generally the main presenting feature otherwise pre covid what was the presenting feature or most of the patients were detected in a routine follow up so that no, could uh, have been yeah. the yeah that is one of them many of them were just uh, patients who knew they had a nevus were but being followed up regularly but uh, the most common symptom is dec decrease in visual acuity for which they present to the clinic thank you um dr aparna is she there she's not there okay uh, dr dhruva jyoti sarkar not there okay uh, dr kiran kumar yeah. oh you are dr kiran okay um, hi kiran so uh, you will be presenting on subconjunctival perilegional interferon alpha 2b in the treatment of ossn yeah. uh, good morning everyone and thanks for the opportunity and i'll be presenting my study on subconjunctival uh, perilegional interferon alpha 2b in management of uh, ossn as we know like ossn is one of the most uh, common uh, uh, class of s tumor uh, which we encounter in our uh, clinical practice and when we see the management uh, protocol which has uh, revo uh, definitely evolving over the past decade with a better understanding of the disease pathogenesis and definitely with improved diagnostic and treatment modalities this is an interesting uh, series of uh, cases which are successfully managed uh, with the perilegional interferon alpha 2b uh, i would like to start uh, with an uh, index case uh, this was an uh, old man who presented to us in a post covid period in a far uh, periphery rural area of karnataka due to the inaccessibility of the treatment during uh, covid times and when we actually saw this case and we had a lot of discussion there is almost like uh, 300 degrees of circumference involvement of the limbus Uh, so it was a tricky decision for us to do whether a complete excision or chemotherapy or any other uh, modal uh, therapy but uh, when we actually did the ubm uh, there was no uh, the scleral or intraocular involvement so, so somehow we took a chance and uh, tried uh, this uh, interferon alpha tub like multiple sessions of about eight injections and he responded very well so with this uh, background uh, we really wanted to know the efficacy of this uh, interferon alpha tub in other uh, variants of ossn so just to brush up the management protocol for the ossn which is available as of now the traditional way is always and that's a gold standard it's a wide surgical excision for the uh, uh, you yeah, for a small lesions definitely for a lesions like this which is um, around or over the entire ocular surface uh, now we can go for the topical therapy so topical therapy came mostly whether it was mitomycin c or 5 fluorouracil which has its own uh, side effects which is very ocular uh, toxic and usually compliance of the therapy with this uh, medications is very less with indian uh, rural areas and especially the storage is also will be difficult for the mitomycin c then they introduced the interferon alpha tub topical therapy uh, this also takes almost like uh, 12 to 14 weeks for the lesion to Uh, resolve completely and the uh, storage was one more problem with this as well so they they introduced like subconjunctival interferon alpha tube it was about uh, like 3 million units per 0.5 ml with this uh, background uh, we we started to evaluate the efficacy of interferon alpha tube in all uh, variants of uh, 
uh, OSS said it was a prospective study which was done in about 68 patients with histologically proven corneal and conjunctal uh, OSS cell with each patient was given about uh, 3 million units of 0.5 ml and uh, followed up uh, weekly till the tumor resolved. And uh, this was an inclusion and exclusion criteria, especially patients who are non compliant and the patients with intraocular preceptal and orbital was excluded from the study. And all patients underwent um, a routine ophthalmic examination and ultrasound by microscopy and also histopathology impression cytology was done in all cases to confirm the diagnosis. This is a very like a simple technique. Uh, it's an OPD procedure which we usually do. This is mainly based on a target IDOS uh, uh, immunotherapy at the target site. We just give it uh, perilesionally uh, so that it should cause ballooning all around the lesion. And uh, after that, we'll advise him an antibiotic and uh, we don't uh, uh, add it with a uh, topical Im immunotherapy. We just give uh, weekly injections uh, till the tumor resolves. And few tips to inject is like uh, the injection should be subconjunctal, perilesional, causing balloonal all around the lesion and care should be taken not to cause hemorrhages because that will definitely uh, cause a problem in for us to follow up for the tumor resolve. So the data was analyzed and uh, patients were monitored closely uh, with uh, regular biomicroscopies and fundus examinations to see for any retinopathy changes. and. Uh, Clinical resolution of the tumor was achieved almost in 95% uh, of the patients and the uh, mean median number of injection was about 6, range was about 2 to 8 injections and the median time taken was about uh, 6 plus or minus 2 weeks. In the time of follow up uh, about 19 months, uh, there are no recurrences till now and 3 cases at chemo reduction and further managed by wide surgical excision. This is a few of the index cases. Uh, which showed a complete uh, resolution and this was a retro positive patient which responded uh, very well just with three injections and so we would like to recommend subconjunctal interferon now as the, the gold standard or safe and effective alternative to surgery and ensures better patients compliance with lesser local side effects. Thank you. Thanks Dr. Uh, for this this nice presentation so i was uh, um, you have used only uh, perilesional interferon no topical interferon no. along with it no. and was there in your inclusion criteria you showed both primary and recurrent cases yes, was yeah. there any difference you noted in the clinical response ma'am uh, usually the cases which recur are more pigmented or the other variants or inappropriate excision primary surgical excision and there was no much difference uh, because our mean uh, resolving time was only four to six weeks irrespective of whether it is primary or recurrent. Okay. What is generally your end point of like stopping the injections? Yeah, there are uh, like uh, clinical uh, photographic uh, evidence and all, I also get an impression cytology at the last follow up. That should be negative. Okay. And you mentioned that the range of injections uh, was like two to eight. Yeah. So and you were giving weekly. Yeah. So must be within two weeks it resolved. Yeah. That yeah. means yes, one of Actually, one uh, this thing was like uh, the patient were retro positive. They responded very well actually. And the largest fusion used to resolve within three to four injection. The pigmented one takes time to resolve. Okay. Any uh, specific reason for not including topical or not? augmenting the treatment with topical in addition to perilesional? Uh, us being a tertiary center, most of the patients, you know, they come to us from rural areas. Uh, they don't have facility for refrigeration. If you don't refrigerate uh, interferon, it is as equal to lubricants. It's not going to help. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So do we have Dr. Priyanka here? Not there. So in that case, we close the session here. Thank you everyone for a patient listening. The results, you can inquire about the results after two hours from the scientific committee office. Thank you everyone.